I, uh, I told this story a few weeks ago, so if, if you were here, you might remember about when I was learning to play guitar um, and how I, I didn't do it out of a desire to learn the instrument necessarily. Um, I did it out of spite uh, because my younger brother was better at guitar than I was, and I, I didn't like that. And uh, so about the same time I was doing that, I, I was learning to play tennis too. This is like when I was in early at high school, and um, I wasn't very good at that either at the time. And I struggled, I was, you know, angsty teenager. I would be upset when I lost tennis matches. I would be frustrated when I couldn't play the songs my brother was playing on guitar. And, and so at some point, um, one of my parents asked me if I wanted to take lessons. If I wanted to, uh, I don't remember if it was for guitar or tennis, maybe, maybe both. Um, and I said the most ridiculous thing. Um, I said, no, I'm not good enough yet. <laughs> Which doesn't make any sense, right? Why? There's, there's no like, threshold of skill you need to obtain to begin to learn something. And, and in fact, you probably are going to do yourself some harm. Um, I, I'm sure that I play guitar very wrong. Um, I certainly, I, I know that I played tennis wrong because I ended up hurting my elbow pretty bad in high school from something that I was doing when I was swinging. Um, but there's this idea that I had, I don't know, it's some, I'm very stubborn. So some stubbornness in my mind that led me to believe that you know, only, only good people can get better. You have to have some level that you start at before you can ascend a higher ladder. But I've practiced a lot. I've practiced most days guitar and tennis um, and other things in my life. And, you know, I'll pose the same question to you. I ask the children, do you have something every day that you do? Do you exercise? Do you, uh, do you play a game? Do you study something. If you're a student, you probably study most days. Um, in my office, we play Wordle. Uh, we have a Wordle competition going in our, our chat, and uh, since none of them will be here to hear this, none of them watch online, I am winning right now. <laughs> but I, I, I do the uh, mini crossword puzzle in the New York Times on their website every day, too. Uh, it's got a little timer you can compete against yourself and see how fast you can do it every day, and that's, that's fun to get better at and uh, to keep the mind sharp as well. So we do these things, right? We have these, these habits, these rituals uh, to improve ourselves, to make ourselves better people, uh, to stay healthy, to live longer, all these kinds of things. And that's uh, what we're going to get at today. This, this is a text on self-improvement, on striving to be more. And so speaking of music, there's, there's a story I read as I was preparing for this from this book called Nothing But the Best. The Struggle for Perfection at the Juilliard School. Juilliard, you know, one of the most illustrious music schools. And uh, it's written by Judith Kogan. She tells it like this. It's about singers at Juilliard. Singers look and act differently from instrumentalists because some say they are vulnerable in a way that instrumentalists are not. The singer is their instrument. The singer is judged not only on what they do with their instrument, but on the quality of the instrument itself. The voice faculty that rejects a candidate seems to say that there is some kind of structural defect. Singers are more touchy, more flamboyant, more exuberant than instrumentalists, because in a way there is more at stake for them. When you are inseparable from your instrument, all of your behaviors and actions reflect upon the quality of your instrument. And whether you're a musician or not, each one of us is an instrument that God has created, an instrument of peace, love, hope, justice. And we are called into service to play in God's orchestra. So should it not be our responsibility then to take the best care we can of our instrument, use it to its fullest potential, what good is a Stradivarius in the hands of someone who never practices? And you know, likewise, wouldn't Jimi Hendrix shred on a thrift store guitar? It is not, or it is the quality of the instrument that matters, and if we are the instruments, we must take care of ourselves and strive to live to our fullest potential. Paul starts off the passage today in Philippians with, with what sounds like a lot of bragging, and I really love the way that John read it. He really got that tone across. <laughs> If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. 
Paul says he has the finest pedigree. He has upheld the laws flawlessly. He was a Pharisee after all, a model religious man in the eyes of Jewish law. And yet, the reason he says all this is not to brag, but to show what he has given up, what he has left behind. And yet, all of these things I count as loss in comparison to knowing Christ. Now, now it's interesting, uh, the NRSV, there's some different language that gets used uh, here in the second part of the passage, depending on what translation you read. And the NRSV does not use the word perfection, where some older translations or some different translations do. Paul says that he is striving for perfection. He has not yet obtained it, but he is working to become more perfect. And I think the reason the NRSV has chosen to sort of omit that kind of translation is because we all have this understanding that perfection is a problematic concept. We are messy as humans. We forget things, we make mistakes. I, uh, I work with some perfectionists. I know some type A people who are perfectionists. And uh, those are some of the most stressed out people in my life. Those people who cannot let go of little mistakes that get made when a date is wrong, when there is a typo in the email. You end up being high strung and you end up stressing over things that with a little bit of grace would be okay. Now, one commentator uh, left this note on perfectionism. At its root, perfectionism isn't really about a deep love of being meticulous. It is about fear. Fear of making a mistake, fear of disappointing others, fear of failure. So I think we all know, we can all agree, there's no such thing as being perfect. The, uh, the great American poet Hannah Montana wrote a song on this, I believe. Nobody's perfect, but then I come across this. John Wesley wrote this collection of works entitled, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection. And John Wesley makes the case, makes the argument that there is a way to become a perfect person. It is obtainable. There is some definition of perfection out there that we can live into. So how do we reconcile these things, these things that we know we cannot be perfect, but Paul calls us to work towards perfection, and John Wesley says there is a way there, there's a path forward. So the first thing we need to look at is the language. And I think the reason the NRSV is not going to use the word perfection is because of the way, the connotation, the denotation that we use of perfection, right? We often use the Latin translation of the word that means flawless, it means perfect without error. Remember, this text was written in Greek. So Paul is using the Greek root of perfection, which does not mean flawless so much as it means maturity, coming into the fullness of our potential, living in to the wholeness of God, becoming what you were made to be. And so at the end of this collection of works, and I invite you to read this, again, the plain account of Christian perfection. It's not that long, um, and you can find it online. It was in the 1700s. It's open source now, right? So at the end of it, uh, John Wesley sort of starts summarizing his ideas, and it's, it's interviews, it's letters, it's hymns. And this is what he says his definition of perfection is at the end. He says, by perfection, I mean the humble, gentle, patient love of God and our neighbor ruling our tempers, our words, our our actions. But I do not include an impossibility of falling from it either, either in part or in whole. And I do not contend for the term sinless, though I do not object against it. We are called to be perfect in our humility, perfect in our love, the humble, gentle, patient love of God. But the possibility of failing is there. You can be perfect and still be fallible. And in in the point after that, he writes, this is what the perfect person, the perfect Christian is not. They are not perfect in knowledge. They are not free from ignorance nor from mistake. We are no more to expect any living person to be infallible than to be omniscient. So Wesley believed that we could be perfect Christians. There was a road to perfection 
that does not require us to be flawless. Because perfection is not about the number of errors that we commit, it is about the way that we conduct ourselves. It is about orienting ourselves in love. Every expression, every act that we commit should be out of love. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is everything we do rooted in love? And I was at, uh, I was at the orientation for my license to preach class yesterday, and some of this may sound familiar because <laughs> when I got there, um, I, I knew what this text was going to be when I was going to preach. I had the title picked out. And I get there, and the sermon that they is on the same thing, is on the same, is on the same passage, and is, has come up with some of the same examples that I've studied. And so it, it was funny to hear those same ideas and, and to uh, also be able to steal a little bit from them. Um, uh, after, what's the percentage before it becomes plagiarism? I don't know. That sermon wasn't recorded, so I think it'll be okay. But uh, the preacher there said that we should be dissolved in holy love dissolved in it. And I liked that a lot as yeah, I'm, a, I'm a science person. I took a lot of chemistry classes. So the, you know, the idea of these chemicals mixing together, dropping something in acid and letting it fall apart. That means that love is not inside of us. If we're dissolving it, love is not inside of us. We are inside of it. Totally surrounded and immersed, inseparable, not able to tell love from what we are. And in this text, Paul puts it, found in Christ. We are found inside of Christ. Now, Wesley has lowered the bar of perfection for us from something that was impossible to reach to something that is now just very difficult to reach. And when asked about the manner in which someone might achieve perfection, Wesley wrote this, I believe that this perfection is always wrought in the soul by a simple act of faith. Consequently, in an instant. But I believe in a gradual work, both preceding and following that instant. Wesley says that there are moments, these instantaneous times, when we can perfectly become conduits of love, when we perfectly channel God. But only if before and after that moment, we are striving to become better. We are striving to be more Christ-like in everything that we do. Can these moments occur? Now, if you, go, if you do go read this document, it's very interesting and very confusing. Wesley kind of waffles back and forth after this on some points because someone asks, okay, you've told us, you've told us what the definition is and when we can achieve it, but like, how? What, what time in our lives, what, what are the steps we have to take for this to happen. And so the third point that is right next in this list is, well, he says, I believe this happens in the instant of death. <laughs> in the instant of death, we can become perfect. And then the next sentence he says, but maybe it's five years or 10 years or 20 years before death. Who can say? Very helpful. Thank you, John. <laughs> but he reiterates his point that it is these moments can happen only if you are constantly working towards them. Paul likes to compare our faith journey to a race. In, in this passage and in other passages, he talks about running. And in verse 14 saying, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I think I've said this before too, but I don't like running. I hate running. A few times a year, usually like January, I'll be like, it's time to start running again. We're going to do it this year. And it's miserable. It's awful every time because I don't do it, right? I do it once a year, and I'd hate it. That's the thing about running. It doesn't work that way. I'm not, I don't have the discipline to be consistent about it. But I was a runner in high school. I understand the race metaphors. They, they click with me a little bit. But, but this particular passage uh, reminded me of something from one of my favorite TV shows. Um, I, my, one of my favorite shows is BoJack Horseman. Fantastic show. deals with mental health and addiction and things like that. Um, it is a cartoon, but it is not for your children. So our, uh, the main character of this show, Bojack, who, who is a horse, ironically, uh, just a very overweight and out-of-shape horse, he, he struggles with uh, depression and addiction, and, and every season in the show, he tries to turn his life around. He, he has a come-to-Jesus moment. He is going to kick his addiction. He's going to get therapy. Uh, he's going to start running and get himself healthy again so he can get back to his acting career. 
Yeah, the whole premise of the show is that he's, he's a, uh, he had a sitcom that was very funny in the 90s, and now he doesn't. Uh, anyway, so he decides he's going to start running. He makes it 100 meters out of his house, and he passes out. He just falls on the, on the ground and collapses. And, he's, and he says, well, why would anyone do this? And then uh, this character that you have seen running by his house every day, every day in the morning, they'll show a picture of his house, this character runs by, this character comes up to him and says, it gets easier. Every day it gets a little easier, but you have to do it every day. So according to Wesley, there are these moments that we can achieve perfection, instants when we can perfectly emulate this love from God, but only if we're willing to put in the work before and after those moments, only if we're willing to practice, only if we're willing to accept that we will stumble and fall and trust that grace will be there to dust us off. And it's hard now, but it gets easier. But only if you do it every day. Now, if you accept these premises, if you accept that perfection is an obtainable thing that we can reach or at least strive for and maybe channel in moments of God's grace, I think there are some precautions we have to take. There are some dangers that loom with accepting that perfection is a tangible thing that we can grasp. And I've got three of them I want us to think about. The first one is thinking that because we can pertain, obtain perfection, we have to be careful not to think that we have obtained it. Right? Wesley did not mince the words, and neither did Paul. They were both very clear. This is a lofty goal. This is something we must always be working towards. And Paul admits he is not there yet. And we talked last week a little bit about the branding problem that Christianity has. And part of the branding problem is the people who think that they are already there. They think that they are always there. They think that they are so far ahead of us, ahead of others, that they can boast about it. We are susceptible, as Christians, to letting our faith become a source of self-confidence and self-righteousness. If we're using this race metaphor, if we're all running the race, there's not a winner. The winner is anyone who crosses the finish line, right? We are not in a competition as Christians running the race of faith. We are working cooperatively. It is our responsibility to bring up the people who are falling behind, not compete against them or boast about how fast we are. Uh, one commentator I was reading gave us this other reminder that says, faith is a central part of the Christian life by which we receive God's grace. And it is important that we remember it is not the means by which we earn God's grace. Faith is only and always a receptacle of grace. Righteousness comes not from anything we say or do or believe, but from Christ alone. Paul's call is for us to better ourselves, but also to humble ourselves. The second pitfall is since we know that we are covered by grace, and we know that the fallible can obtain perfection, we must be wary of complacency. We sang this uh, great song this morning called Holy Water by uh, We the Kingdom in the nine o'clock service, and I love the bridge of this song. It goes, I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. If we're continuing with our sports metaphors, the athletes who are at the top of their game, at the top of the world, the Michael Phelpses, Usain Bolts, Simone Biles, Serena Williams, the greatest athletes in the world, don't get to the top and stop. They're not done once they've gotten there, once they've, they've won whatever championship, Olympic gold medal. They continue to train, they continue to improve, and we must do the same. We have to continue to improve. We can't rest on the laurels that grace is free and for all of us, and no matter what we do, we have it. We are already on God's team. But our awareness of that unconditional acceptance should encourage us and motivate us to strive further towards perfection, not allow us to get comfortable riding the bench. The last thing, last thing we need to watch out for, is letting the outcomes of our actions dictate whether we are correctly practicing love. 
it is very easy for us as people and, and for us in a, in a community, you know, with the university and in my job, so many things in the world now are data-driven, right? You need, you need actual numbers, you need quantitative evidence that you are doing the right thing. And that's just not a good measuring stick for the way that we practice love. There, there's a, star, I know we have a few Star Trek fans out here. I love the Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek. There's this line he says to Data, is, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. It is possible to be doing the right thing and not get the outcome you were expecting, the outcomes you want, to see the numbers the way you want to see them. If we try to measure our successes or, or even our failures as Christians by how many people were singing the hymns this morning, or how many churches disaffiliate from the conference, or by how far we move the moral compass in this country through our activism. No matter what measuring stick we use, we're eventually going to feel like we're failing if the numbers don't keep trending our way. And so the danger is that we let that happen. We just don't need to. We need to. Our mission isn't to keep track of score. We don't have to make sure we're putting up more points than the other team. We have to make sure that we're casting the net wide, that we are catching all the people we can and trusting the Holy Spirit will work both in the people we catch and the people we don't. God's grace covers them regardless. So it's our job to let the Holy Spirit work through us in the ways that we are able to. We are called to look for and respond to opportunities where we can channel God's love, where we can be conduits for the love to work. We are called to surrender. Paul tells us to leave behind the things that are holding us back and press on. Be fully dissolved in love. Do not worry about what lies ahead nor what lies behind. Surrender our desire to be flawless and accept the calling to be made perfect. And we do that by loving God, by loving our neighbor, and by walking with Christ each and every day. Amen.